Hello everyone, and welcome to Biomed Device Boston. I am Adrienne Cepeda, Event Director of Biomed Device. We put together a full schedule for you over the next two days, over 20 free educational sessions, our masterclass conference program, including a startup series in partnership with MassMedic, and tomorrow a cybersecurity series in partnership with Valenium. We have over 200 exhibitors ready to share their latest products and services that will provide solutions to your engineering challenges. And let's not forget about networking, happy hour, welcome reception, and our sugar rush taking place tomorrow to jumpstart your day. There's a lot to see and do. I hope you brought business cards and comfortable shoes. Now onto this morning's highly anticipated keynote presentation by Erica Chung, Theranos whistleblower and executive director of ethics and entrepreneurship. We invited Erica to speak this morning because of her experience at Theranos, her bravery for calling out unethical practices, and for her work in tackling ethics and entrepreneurship. So without further ado, please help me in giving Erica a warm welcome. Hi everyone, good morning. It's uh, great to be here and I'm really excited to sort of share a little bit about the Theranos saga in addition to how this cautionary tale can really inform a lot of what we do in healthcare spaces and in the biotechnology industry. So I wanted to start off sort of uh, with a recent fascination of mine and this is the way in which history kind of repeats itself over and over and how the same incidences can happen um, even hundreds of years down the line. So I wanted to start with a story from the 1900s. And this is a story about uh, Therese Humbert. So Therese Humbert was this woman who was really engaged with having this extravagant lifestyle. And so what she had done is basically, at one point she was driving, or she was in a, uh, train and she stumbled upon a man who was having a heart attack and this man was um, about to keel over but she took out some smelling salts and she put it underneath the man and it revived him so he no longer died and because of this incident in his will he basically decided that he was going to give over a whole bunch of his inheritance over to her and the uh, only way that she could receive this inheritance is if she um, waited until the 21st birthday of his firstborn daughter. And so all this inheritance was stuck inside the safe for her to collect once his daughter turned 21. So what she had done is she had essentially taken this narrative and she had gone to financiers and bankers and basically said, you know, I just need a loan. I have this money in this safe that I'm gonna collect at the 21st birthday of, um, uh, of this uh, person's birthday. And so she went from financier to financier and basically got more and more dolled up, more jewelry, more uh, fancy dresses and everything else until there was one financier that said, hold on, all of the legal costs now, just to draft up these contracts is probably more than the inheritance that you're going to receive in this safe. So finally, people decided to congregate and all these financiers came up and they said, okay, we need to open this. We don't care about this birthday of this 21st daughter. Let's sit down, get around this safe and open it up. And when they cracked open the safe and everyone was sitting there, what fell out was a single brick. And that was it. And so it's funny how this case in the 1900s is very similar to the case that I experienced of asking this fundamental question of what is inside the box and how this one simple question could have made all the difference in terms of the outcomes of, of what happened in people's lives. So I was a bit intimidated, especially coming on in front of everyone in the biomedical industry because really, when you think about it, I was 22 and worked for a uh, bioscience company for seven months in a lab services company, and it happened to be one of the most high profile failures. So what is it that you all are gonna learn from me 
<laughs> being a 22 year old in one of the biggest scandals in the healthcare industry. And I think for me, when I go and I do these talks, you know, a big initiative and a big goal of mine is really, you know, how do we prevent these huge ethical collapses from happening in healthcare ever again? And this is, is really my ethos. And when I think about cautionary tales, there's a bit of fear of going up there and sort of finger wagging and telling people this is what you should and should not do. But I think there's also a power in cautionary tales to really give us an opportunity to sink in to stories and the narratives that other people have done and learn from their failures and sort of garner some wisdom of what are the possibilities of how things could go wrong? What are the obstacles that we're gonna face in the future? And what are the things that we can maybe prepare ourselves in our own journeys of when failures exist? And you know, there's something interesting about this. I think we always, when we think about entrepreneurship, there's this ethos that you should be really positive and focus on the vision and everything else. But actually when they've done research on goals and how to successfully complete your goals, it was found that you're actually two times more likely to be successful if you imagine the obstacles that you're going to face than if it's just focusing on you know, what is the vision of all the possibilities of what I want to come true. So hopefully this is uh, backed by science that cautionary tales have this, this really wonderful ability to, at least in my case of the goal of preventing these massive ethical lapses from happening of sort of providing some value there. So I invite you all to kind of enter into this story with a little bit of ethical humility, because I think it's easy to look at these cases and to think, oh, you know, look at this person. Of course, it's the case that, you know, they created this big scandal or that, you know, they are just these bad actors. But really, I think there's a possibility for all of us to be in these types of circumstances and to find our own values and our own boundaries of what we would think acceptable and unacceptable to be pushed given the right environments and the right circumstances. And I really love this quote, and I think it applies not just to driving, but it says, the one thing that unites all human beings, regardless of age, gender, religion, economic status, or ethnic background, is that deep down inside, we all believe that we are above average drivers. And I think this not only applies to driving, but I think it just generally applies to many aspects of life. So I wanna give you guys a bit of context because I think the Theranos case cannot be taken out of context. And I wanna kind of transport you guys back in time to the Silicon Valley in 2013, 2012. And so the Silicon Valley was really its own culture. You know, the moment you have satires being made, the moment you have fashion that's oriented, you know, everyone's walking around, Patagonia sweaters, company logo, all birds. There was really this sort of like ethos and hype around being a part of the technology industry, being a part of the Silicon Valley. And it wasn't just something that was isolated to a particular region. It was really something that was broader than that. You had it as a mindset. It was a way of thinking that couldn't necessarily just be applied to San Francisco and south of San Francisco, but you had Silicon ba Dragon in China, you had Silicon Beach in Los Angeles. It was just really this sort of exportable culture and it had big goals you know it was out to change the world it wasn't the case that these were just businesses these were really things that were mission driven impact driven and they really wanted to change people's life and beyond that at this time everyone's making a lot of money so right at this stage a few years before a lot of the big internet companies had finally ipo'd so you had facebook and twitter ipoing in addition to that you had um major acquisitions that were happening. So Instagram had only been in operation for about two years before it got acquired by Facebook for a billion dollars. So to go from zero to a billion dollars was quite successful. And I think it really sort of created this investment sentiment of the fear of missing out. Investors weren't so scared of the fact that they might miss out on $10 million of a lost investment. They were scared of the fact if they didn't make an investment in the next Amazon that they could have not got another 50x. So this was kind of the climate. Everyone was really excited. There were people coming from all over the world to basically work on these giant tech campuses. And embedded there was a little company called Theranos at that time. 
And at this moment, there wasn't much known about the company. There was about two articles in one video. And I kind of wanted to give you guys a glimpse into this video of the founder back in, in 2009. Oh, this is the one article from the Wall Street Journal, basically about Elizabeth Holmes. And then this is, this is the video. So she did manage to get a lot of people to believe in her. And she managed to raise $700 million at a $9 billion valuation. Her investors included people like the Walton family, Betsy DeVos, and Larry Ellenson of, of Oracle. And then she also managed to acquire a sort of high-profile board. So she had people like George Shultz, who was the ex-Secretary of State during the Reagan years, Henry Kissinger, and James Mattis on her board. She got buy-in from basically every media organization that put her on the cover of every major magazine. Um, and, you know, she was really allotted as the, you know, next self-made female billionaire. So what kind of happened in a very short time span to go on one of the richest people, self-made people in the world, to one of the biggest scandals in at least one of the most highly reported U.S. scandals in, in history. What was that delta and what sort of went on there and what can we learn from it? So where did things go wrong? So I wanted to give you guys a bit of look into the transformation. That was her in 2009 and this was later in 2013. information about themselves and their own bodies that can change their lives. Every person should have the ability to get that type of test because if you understand that early that you're at risk, there's a lot more that you can do about it. And we'd like to see a world in which every person gets access to this type of basic testing. And the types of tests that are done are ones that provide insight into the onset of disease. So what was Theranos doing? What was it trying to accomplish? So Theranos' mission was, our mission is to make actionable information accessible to everyone at the time that matters. So how were they accomplishing this? Essentially, Theranos had created these proprietary devices, these medical devices, where it was claimed that they were able to take a drop of blood or a finger stick sample and be able to run a whole wide array of blood panels. So they had promised at one point that you could do 200 different types of tests on this singular machine. And the beauty of it wasn't necessarily just the medical device in itself. It was also the fact that there was price transparency. So you know exactly how much each of the tests cost. And they had also worked out a deal in Arizona that they were lobbying for policy change that patients could actually ask and request what types of tests that they wanted to do. In addition um, to the fact that they were deploying these in, in Walgreens all over the place, so there was more of this direct-to-consumer interaction uh, through these Walgreens vehicles. And so this was, this was fascinating as an outsider. People were trying to really figure out what did Theranos figure out that no one else figured out. You know, how were they able to finally develop these point-of-care diagnostics that were able to run a whole wide array of different types of tests? And, you know, I had seen this as a recent grad out of UC Berkeley, and I was super excited. You had the strong founder. You had a lot of buy-in from a lot of different people. I thought the board was kind of strange. 
But at the same time, you know, what was going on? What was the technology that they were using? And what had they figured out that no one else figured out? In addition, I think a lifelong mission of mine is how do you make healthcare more accessible and more affordable? And it seemed that she had this very, very strong alignment with that mission. Um, but almost immediately while working for the company, I started to notice that things were wrong. And about a month in when I was working there, I had started off basically as a research and development lab associate and I was working on all the validation studies. So we were trying to figure out, you know, what is the accuracy? What is the precision of these devices and everything else? And um, almost within three weeks or a month, I noticed at least one particular issue that was happening. So we would stand in front of the whole lab department and look at data sets like this. And all of a sudden it would be shown that our precision wasn't good, our accuracy wasn't good, that there was some sort of issue. And it would be said, oh, well, delete the outlier. And so I would look at that and I was like, well, which one is the outlier, right? You have no idea, you have no idea. You just keep all the information in there and that gives you clarity on what is the performance of the system. But this was a tactic that was used constantly where they were just saying, okay, let's, let's get rid of this outlier and see how that affects the accuracy. Let's get rid of that outlier or redo, you know, three works. Let's, let's basically do three months worth of precision work in three days and then anything that doesn't work, we're just gonna excision out and then have, you know, another lab associate work over the clock for one more day and replace. So this was scary to me because um, clearly we were having issues, but we didn't have clarity on what was the extent of these issues because of this particular practice. And because of this practice, I think what was happening is then we were seeing a lot of downstream consequences. So my role started off as lab associate, trying to validate these devices, and then they stuck me into the clinical lab and said, we want you to integrate these lab devices into a clinical setting which we all know is a bit scarier and the tables have sort of turned because now you're regulated. You're no longer a scientist tinkering in a lab, but you're really now testing actively on patients. And about two months in from working for the company, uh, I had this sort of nightmare when I was running a quality control. So a patient came in and I was running the quality control, which I knew was about like 20 nanograms per mil. And so I go to run the quality control and it comes out something outrageous, like you know, 150 nanograms per mil. So this would be suggestive if this was a real patient that, you know, this person was overdosing on vitamin D. So I was like, oh, okay, what's, what's kind of going on here? Did I trip? Did I sneeze? Like, what's, what's happening? Um, but then I would run it again, and then it would come out two nanograms per mil. So I was like, oh, okay, what's happening? And then I'd run it again, and it'd come out 35 nanograms per mil. And so here I have the same sample, I've run it three times and it's come out three different results and there are different clinical outcomes. And so this is just one example, but this was happening across the board. This was happening for hormone panels, for infectious disease, for other types of, of mineral panels. And so it was quite scary, the fact that with the quality control infrastructure, we were having this amount of variability on a every two day basis. Like this wasn't just sort of a one-off incident. This was happening all the time in the lab uh, across, across different assays. And the scary thing was, is we were running maybe like 100 patients a day, maybe less than that. But the goal was, is that Theranos had had this huge Walgreens expansion. And so the goal was to be processing about 2,000 patients a day in Walgreens store Walgreens stores across uh, Arizona to begin with, but uh, across the U.S. eventually. And so what was kind of going on behind closed doors? So part of the reason that Theranos had this really high profile political board was it did help them, at least they attempted to sort of use their political clout to sort of expedite government deals. So one of the things about being on this side of the case, I have my own personal story, but now I get approached by a lot of people about their own experiences and there was an instance in which Theranos was trying to basically get their devices on the battlefield for soldiers. And you can imagine if you're having that type of error rate and they're trying to sort of push through the pilot process for these government deals, that could have had really severe consequences. And then on the investment side, I had a Singapore investor come to me and talk about some of the tactics that they would use. So at one point Theranos had called this investor and said, 
hey, guess what? We have two slots open, open for investment, but you have to contact us in two days. And if you don't contact us in two days, you might lose this spot to another investor. So you better hurry up and get in here and do this, this talk because we don't know if we can accept you or not. So these sort of rush tactics were what was being utilized on these investors to give them that sentiment that you need to make this deal now. And in addition to that, once the investors would have a certain intrigue, during these investor demos, essentially what they would do is they'd have the investors come in, they'd go through this sort of like white glove experience in the, in the, in the office where a phlebotomist would come in, they would do the sample, and when the sample was collected, what people thought was happening is that it would basically be processed maybe a little bit, put into the cartridge, put in the machine and run, what was actually happening is that the moment they left out the door, they would grab that blood sample, they would run it back to a back laboratory. There were like six different teams on standby and utilizing like four jerry-rigged machines, this one proprietary device that they had developed that didn't really work all that well. And then everyone would be fighting over this tiny little blood sample to eventually get all their results from all the prospective machines and then send it out of the patients ideally in two hours if it worked, if it didn't. And you can see, you know, this is the lab that they took pictures. Uh, actually, <laughs> this, that back area over there where that uh, green barrier is, is actually where the real Theranos laboratory was with card key access and they sort of had security guards sort of shuffle these uh, green barriers everywhere so people couldn't see what was going on. Um, so while this was going on, I think another big red flag for me when I worked in the company is like sort of understanding all this context, understanding all these theatrics was uh, the moment when we had to essentially articulate to regulators about proficiency testing. So typically for proficiency testing, what you'll do is you'll basically tell regulators what device you're using, they'll give you samples, you run those samples through your normal workflow, and then you see, did you pass or did you fail? It's a simple process. But what Theranos did is we essentially ran those samples on two separate devices, we generated results, and we found that there were extremely disparate results between what the Edisons were doing and what uh, I think it was the Siemens Inmulite was like the comparable device, so not the Advia. And what they did is instead of telling regulators, hey, you know, we're testing patients using this, this LDT, this other device, they ended up sending the Siemens Emulite data, and of course we passed. But what's happening here, right? We have this whole different range of results that are happening with these Edison devices, and that is what they're actually using to test on patients. So this was super concerning to me. It was like all these factors between the lab practices and what was happening with the quality control data, and then this, you know, this decision to essentially deceive people and what was actually going on became very, very concerning. So eventually I had raised my concerns with the COO because I thought that maybe there was some sort of disjunct between what was happening at the operational floor and what the executive management knew and was really operating in good faith that um, maybe people just didn't really realize the extent of the problems that were occurring. And essentially when I sat into his office and I told him, I'm really concerned about the failures in the quality controls, the stability of our rate, there were so many, so many issues <laughs> that I, I could talk about. Um, he essentially said, you are a recent graduate out of UC Berkeley. Have you ever taken a statistics class? Have you ever done anything? What you need to do is the job I pay you to do, which is to process patient samples without question. So at that point, I was shocked because then I knew, okay, they know what's going on. They're just not doing anything about it. And now this is in a territory that's, that's very terrifying. Um, so that night, I ended up calling up a friend who was Tyler Schultz. We were good friends in the organization. And I knew Tyler Schultz's grandfather was on the board of directors of the company and said, you know, hey, I just had my conversation with Sonny. Uh, I, I don't think I can work here anymore. And he said, hey, I'm gonna have dinner with my grandfather. Would you want to come? And so we go to George Schultz's house, and it's still to this day probably one of the nicest houses I've ever been to. 
Uh, and we sat down and had dinner with him and I basically explained to him the same thing I explained to you, where what you think is going on is not actually what's going on behind closed doors. When you think that you just get your finger, your blood drawn and they stick it into this machine and it pops out a result, there's actually this huge circus of things that are occurring um, in this back laboratory and the reliability and the results really can't be trusted. And he basically said to me, you know, you seem very smart. I know my grandson is smart, but I brought in a lot of really intelligent people into this company and they all say it works. So I think it works. So I was pretty lost. I was like, what do you, what do you do now? Right? Like you've taken up to every possible person. But what I knew is, you know, maybe I was wrong. Maybe there was something I wasn't seeing. But at the end of the day, the one thing I knew I was right about was the fact that when we made a mistake on a patient, we did not let them know that we made a mistake. And I just couldn't stand for that. And so I quit the company and was just like, I, I need to go. Um, and, and I don't feel comfortable working here at this point. And then uh, I kind of got lucky after being uh, very depressed, very uh, disempowered from this whole experience, um, sort of a hard wake up call into the work, up <laughs> work life of this being my first job out of college and being like, wow, is this the way the world, world works? This is, a, this is a real harsh reality. But uh, um, John ended up contacting me. He was a Wall Street Journal reporter and he had basically known that I was gonna be freaked out because the company had reminded me all throughout the time I worked there, after I worked there, that if I had said anything to anyone, I signed a non-disclosure ag agreement and that they would come after us. It was very clear. Even before I started working for the company, there, there were conversations about that. And he said, I know you're freaked out, but there are a lot of other people that are freaked out and they are telling me that um, what Theranos is claiming that they do isn't what, actually what's happening. And I, it was like a sigh of relief. It was like, okay, here is another opportunity, another door to get people to realize the truth of what's happening. So I was one of the early sources for John Carreyrou. And in addition to that, um, uh, and because of that, basically Theranos had gone on this huge witch hunt for all of us. And so at this point, um, this is sort of an odd case, but I had known not only am I, were they threatening litigation on me, but they were following me. Uh, the reason is, is I had been um, staying at a friend's house. I had just left my old apartment. I was waiting to move into a new one. I was staying on a friend's house on her couch. No one knew where I was staying. And on the letter that they had basically waited outside of my new workplace all day to hop out of a tinted window <laughs> SUV to give to me, it said my colleague's address. So at that point, I knew, okay, these people are following me. Um, was very scared, very freaked out. And it was funny because during the trial, this was actually confirmed. It wasn't the ca case I was being paranoid that the company did spend over $150,000 to follow Tyler Schultz and, and myself um, in, in this case. Um, so this was all going on. And while this was going on, the benefit of that is I figured out that you can actually report to regulators. And this was like completely outside of my scope of, of what I knew to do. And so I had reported to the Center of um, Medicare and Medicaid Services, who of course is in charge of all the CLIA amendments. And um, luckily, uh, after this report that I had written, um, CMS came in and they did an investigation and the investigation basically found that there were major deficiencies all throughout the Theranos laboratories and it shut down their patient processing lab. And so throughout this whole experience, this was my only objective. I just wanted the company to stop processing patient samples. Like if they wanted to be a medical device company and sort of work on their research and sort of figure out how to create a new point of care diagnostic, that's fine. Would I trust it? No. But at the same time, you know, I just knew that they shouldn't have been basically experimenting on the public at this point. So um, after this, there's been a whole timeline of events. What's funny is I didn't actually engage with a lot of this. I moved to Asia and rebuilt my whole life in venture capital. So it was a bit funny um, sort of coming back to the U.S. and realizing all of these things happened because I was really uh, just trying to move forward as, as fast and as quickly as possible. But Theranos essentially had settled with CMS to stop patient testing in 2017. The company started in 2003. A lot of people seem not to know this, that it was around for almost uh, 15 years. 
Um, then there was sort of the onslaught of different charges. So Theranos was charged with massive fraud in 2018. In June of 2018, uh, they were indicted. In September of 2018, Theranos finally shut down and it closed its doors and it went under. Um, and it hasn't been uh, until about 2021 that all the trials were kind of occurring and the finalizations of the trials have happened relatively recently. So on January of 2022, Elizabeth Holmes was charged on four counts of wire fraud. Uh, in July of 2022, Sunny Balwani was charged of 12 out of 12 charges of both wire and patient fraud. And so we are awaiting the sentencing basically now. I was hoping it would be done by now. I was trying not to speak to anyone until it was done, but uh, that, that didn't happen. It, keep getting, it kept getting pushed. Um, so one of the kind of revelatory experiences that I had had was actually reading this book. And there was this book called The Seven Signs of Ethical Collapse by Marianne Jennings. And essentially what she had done is she had looked at a lot of these different corporate frauds and tried to synthesize down what were some of the elements and predictors that could have dictated um, whether an ethical collapse was happening. And when I kind of looked at the cases of WorldCom or Enron, it was funny how also in the Theranos case, it kind of ticked all these boxes in certain ways. So the pressure to maintain numbers, a culture of fear and silence, sort of young staff, because everyone at Theranos was fairly young, like I was given responsibility, frankly, I, sh I shouldn't have been given. Um, and these sort of bigger than life CEOs, a weak board, despite the fact that we had a very well-known board in terms of their accomplishments in uh, certain areas, n no one had a bioscience background. No one had a, a research background of any kind or a really strong medical background. There were conflicts of interest, there is innovation like uh, no other, and goodness in some areas atoning for evil in others. So, you know, some of the obvious, you know, conflicts of interest here, uh, maybe telling people that you're in a relation, the CEO and the COO is in a relationship with one another, that's sort of an important thing to reveal. The fact that one of your board members is also your paid attorney is probably something that you should mention. And so these were things that were really kept under wraps and hidden and probably led to less than ideal decision making in terms of resolving some of these errors early on versus letting them escalate and fester into what came to be a, a huge downfall. And I think another thing we have to pay attention to is this notion of innovation like no other. So sometimes when we are creating these highly innovative products, there is this explanation that I'm above the law like the rules that exist, the principles that exist, like not harming patients don't apply to me because I'm in a class of my own. And so this is something that I think people need to be conscious of is the fact that you still have guiding principles in terms of you know, the way in which you develop medical devices, the way in which you go into patient processing. And uh, Theranos had really just said, the rules don't apply to us. We don't need to engage with regulators. You know, we're in a totally different class of device. And I, I heard this a lot, uh, particularly coming from the COO. And goodness in some areas atoning for evil in others and this idea of moral licensing. And so I think this is something that also in healthcare you have to be careful of and something that you saw here a lot. You know, Elizabeth Holmes was not just the next Steve Jobs. She was the next Steve Jobs in the most benevolent of industries in healthcare. She was out there to basically make lab testing uh, less painful, more affordable, more accessible. There were all these beautiful things in the mission that she was trying to accomplish that were a net benefit, that were seen as positive, that they were all things that we really wanted to believe could be possible. And you have to be careful in that clouding the judgment to make it seem like actually what your mission is, is, is all that there is and that you're not paying attention to sort of the day-to-day -day behaviors and the realities of, of sort of what you're conducting and engaging with. And I think, you know, out of all this conversation, one of the most important to sort of center on and one of the things that I think isn't talked about is the voiceless victims in this case. So Theranos had sold 1.5 million blood tests, which was about 7.8 millions because some of those were panels uh, uh, for, you know, 175,000, almost 176,000 Arizona consumers. 
when the prosecution basically did their um, discovery and their investigation, they found that it was likely that 51.3% of these patient results were false. So that's, that's crazy when you think of those numbers. That means that, you know, what is that, like 75,000, 80,000 people probably received false results. What were the implications to their lives? We don't know, we don't know, especially because they destroyed the patient database that would have maybe made it easier to investigate this type of information, but it doesn't exist anymore. So there's no way to really get into contact with those people to see what kind of impact it may have had on their lives. So this is, you know, this point of ethical humility, um, the fact that, you know, there is the capacity and capability that all of us can be in these situations and really figuring out what our values are and what our boundaries are in these types of circumstances is really important because there are lots of environments that can put pressure on us that really sort of bend our ability to make good decisions and things that, you know, we deem as an acceptable, not only for you know, our, uh, other people, but ourselves. And I think we, we need to understand that healthcare in particular has a certain amount of responsibility, a certain responsibility to be competent and to be capable. And, you know, it's not just about the patient stories. You know, the, the, if you think in the Theranos case, these are first time mothers, these are cancer patients. These are people who are athletes and want to just have better performance. Whatever it might be, there just has to be a stronger anchor on the fact that there needs to be a sense of responsibility in every little detail of the work that we have, because it's just the nature of this industry. Um, and even if it's the case that you don't care about other people, which probably there's a percentage of people that that's the case, like even think about it in the context of yourself, right? if it was the case that I had received a result that told me, you know, I didn't and wasn't at risk at cancer, but actually I was. And what would be the implications of that on someone's life? You know, these are really important considerations to take in, into our field. Um, so, you know, if there's one thing that I realize, you know, mistakes are a fact of life. It's the response to the error that counts by the poet Nikki Giovanni. I think this is really important and something that hopefully each of us sort of thinks about as we carry it into our own work, especially as scientists and people who work in, in the sciences more broadly, we all know that there's gonna be issues. It's really about what we do about them that makes the difference. And so it's funny, you know, sometimes uh, this, this notion that Reagan had said, trust but verify, that's important. And I hope at the end of this, the one thing I'll leave you with is that each of you will not be scared to ask that simple question of uh, what's inside the box if you ever encounter that. So, so thank you.